Hello, and welcome to Paint Yourself Into the Picture, healing conversations to help us create the best and brightest picture of our lives. I'm Reba Linker, best-selling author, life coach, and manifesting guru, and I'm so glad you're here. We have the first guest on our new, on our new She Rose and Pathfinders series, and I'm so excited. But first, a two-minute teaching. When you learn something, it's important not just to learn the mechanics of the subject. It is also important to learn to adopt the mindset of the mechanic. So, what I like to say in the beginning of my manifesting courses is that learning manifesting, in this case, is less like buying a lottery ticket and more like owning a Ferrari. If you buy a lottery ticket and it's not the winning ticket, you just throw out the stub and go on. It's over. It's done. If you own a Ferrari, needless to say, if something's wrong, you don't throw out the car. You take it to the mechanic and you find out what's wrong and you tinker till it's firing on all cylinders. So learning a new subject is very much like that. And it's so important. It's so self-loving to take on the mindset of the mechanic because the mechanic doesn't get discouraged when it doesn't go right the first time. There's a curiosity about figuring out the puzzle and making it work. So I'll just end this two-minute teaching with a quote from Thomas Edison. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. And that's from Thomas Edison, and he should know. All right, so let's go on. Our, let me introduce our guest, Tay Lynn. Her mission, her mission is to inspire others to live a more meaningful life by practicing kindness and acceptance to all. By sharing her own journey of loss, depression, and illness, she shows others how to make an impact and create a kinder world one minute at a time. She is the author of Green Smoothies to the Rescue, available on Amazon. Sharing how she dealt with a painful digestive disorder, Tay hopes to help others who may be going through similar issues. Tay, welcome to Paint Yourself into the Picture. Thank you for having me, Reba. I'm thrilled to be here. It's so wonderful to have you here. I love what you do. And I'm just going to jump in and just say, Tay, what is your passion? My passion is kindness. <laughs> <laughs> kindness and compassion and acceptance and not judging others. Um, I really just found this um, passion as uh, when, I, when I became ill and found it as a means of making myself feel better. And so it's just taken off from there. It is, it's so beautiful. And what I'm hoping to accomplish in this, in this interview is to, to show the greatness of what you've discovered. Because what I find in this world is we all have such big eyes. I can't tell you as a coach, and even in these interview series, how many people are approaching it like, I want to change the world. They have very, very big goals. And your goals, I know, are also big, but you're doing it 60 seconds at a time. Little. Little steps, baby steps. <laughs> yeah, so, so what was the journey like for you? I, were you one of those big-eyed people to start with? And, and how did you kind of come back to this let's start small idea? Well, I think I've always volunteered um, as a kid uh, through adulthood in some fashion, um, particularly with the elderly in nursing homes um, and dogs and, and rescue um, shelters. Those always pulled at my heart as a child and, and through young adulthood. But um, after I became ill, I wallowed in a lot of self-pity for a while and, and losing my job and not being able to work, I felt like my purpose was gone because my job was my purpose, or so I thought. Um, I never was able to have children uh, after being born with a kidney issue. So I, you know, I was hit pretty hard with depression and thought 
you know, that's it. There's, there's nothing left. Why even stick around here and seriously consider ending my life. Um, and it, there was like an epiphany, one of the dark nights of the soul, I guess they say, where um, I heard a voice tell me that I was enough, that I've always been kind and compassionate and to go out and spread that. And that's my true purpose. And, you know, I, I just thought, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard it, but I, you know, again, I was, you, you kind of like, did I really hear that? Or, you know, but, um, you know, I had been going through so many doctors uh, in the beginning, being bed bound for eight months and getting, trying to get a diagnosis that um, at some point on my journey, I was in a doctor's office and there was a uh, blind woman that walked in and um, couldn't tell if there were any empty chairs in the room. And so my simply helping her saying, oh, right over here, you can sit next to me, this chair's empty. And then continuing to help her as I'm filling out all my paperwork, no one else in the room, like 15 to 20 people would not assist this woman. She just would, you know, speak out loud, is my van here to pick me up? And everyone just sat there. So I got up and looked out the window and went in to see if her, her van was there and it wasn't. So she called the van service and then finally it came and there was a kid by the window, a young man, and he's mouthing over to me, it's here. I'm her now her guardian or go-to person so he wouldn't say it to her so I had to tell her went out and talked to the van driver made sure it was the right van for her and escorted her out and not thinking anything of it I'm just not being myself I'm being kind and compassionate and then I sat back down and a young girl in the waiting room um I felt her looking at me I looked up and she said you know that was really kind of you nobody was willing to help her and you stopped what you were doing to help her and it inspired me and I want to go out and help somebody or pay it forward today myself. So I thought, well, that was really actually very something simple to do. And yet it did make an impact not only on the blind woman herself, but on this other girl um, who witnessed it. Wow. And then I guess from there is where the idea began. And I just, on my own, started doing things whenever I got out of the house um, to go to a doctor's office or to the grocery store or the, the drug store, um, little by little. And then I was writing down little things that I had done. Journaling, because I would journal. You know, I just was journaling at the time. And um, I was speaking with somebody at one point that they said, this this is huge. You should you should write a book, you should blog, you should, and I'm thinking, well, it's just little stuff I do. I mean, <laughs> and I didn't realize the power of it and how every little act adds up to a huge impact because every little thing you do along the way for multiple people, that's changing maybe three people's lives, five people's lives, however many people you touch that day. And it's going to create a huge impact in the world. And if we all did something together, what a he like a tsunami it would be. <laughs> yes, that's a it's an, an incredible story. And one of the things that strikes me in the story is that it was something so simple and natural for you. Like sometimes people think it has to be hard. I have to do something really big. I have to do something really great. And I think our culture kind of promotes that. Right. And we all have these, like I said, these big eyes and these starry-eyed dreams. And for you to realize it's, I, you know, you just had to be you. And that's amazing enough. Yeah. 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 And I, it led me to, um, first I started my Facebook page, um, 60 Seconds to Kindness, on Facebook before I had a website. And I just started posting inspirational quotes about kindness. Um, and then any stories or acts I'd come across, but just trying to spread the message. And I came up with the slogan, you know, changing the world one minute at a time. Because, and sometimes it's not even 60 seconds. It could take five seconds to smile at another person or eye contact. For me, it's all about making someone feel seen. Yeah. Um, how many times you're at the grocery store checking out and you just look down as you're load, unloading your cart and that person's looking down and then you exchange money or you slide your card and you leave and you never even really looked at them or said hello or so practicing things like that um but it it led me to then create my website and um 
a ten a little giveaway called Ten Simple Ways to Make a Difference. And it, I wrote it in mind for anyone with chronic illness who is stuck in the house that thinks, "Well, I can't go out. I can't go out and do those things," or those people who are just too busy. You know, they're not sick, but they they have a full time job. They may have children. They may participate in sports, whatever. They just have no time. And I have a lot of little ideas in there of simple things, getting back to basics of how you can make an impact in the world. Why don't you share, because it's for the busy people. They're so busy that they almost can't breathe. How would you help them? Because it's, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a real, it's a, I'm really glad that you also help the too busy people because that becomes almost like a syndrome in itself where you're, you're in this rat race and it doesn't feel good and you're not making yourself feel good and you're not making others feel good either, but you're just so busy. How can you help somebody like that? Right. Well, first I would say to that person, being kind to yourself mm. first and slowing down because stress really does do a number on your body and it really does impact your immune system and allow for illnesses to set in. Um, so I would say, take a moment and <laughs> make sure you're meditating and breathing throughout the day so you're helping yourself first. But the simple things, like I just said, you could open a door for somebody, you could smile at somebody, you know, paying for the coffee for the person behind you. They're all things in the course of your day that you're doing anyway. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not that difficult. Um, holding the elevator door when somebody's rushing and so many people are in a rush and they're pushing the button to close, 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 and <laughs> nobody rushing and they're still close. close. You know? so, so there are all things that you don't know because that happened to me one time and I never did that. I would always hold the door. I'd be the one holding the door and everybody else in the elevator is getting mad at me. But this one girl was like, oh, thanks, I'm on the way to an interview. I mean, you don't know how you're going to impact that next person. What you're going to do to change, it, it, it's like setting off a chain of events. So yeah. there's simple things that give people like that. Yeah, I think this is so brilliant. I can't actually express how brilliant it is because it's, it's so, it's so uh, under the radar, you know, and it's so, you know, it's not, it's not the uh, values that our culture promotes. Yeah. And yet, I think you're really on to something in terms of it being, uh, if there's something like heavenly values or true values, there's a, there's a funny anecdote in the Jewish tradition about a rabbi whose son is on his deathbed and everybody gathers around for his last moments and they pray and they pray. And lo and behold, the son who is basically in a coma wakes up and his father, the great rabbi says, you know, son, what was it like where you were? And the boy says, father, where I was, the world was upside down. Huh. In other words, you know, the, the, the saying, the meek shall inherit the earth and, and what's valued on earth isn't valued there. And it isn't valued on it's it's everything is is flipped and I thought that's that that anecdote you know brings uh, you know connects with what you do so well because you're you're doing I would say there's a hierarchy of the better things to do and you're doing the heavenly values let's say well thank you. Yeah. And like I said, for me, it was things that I always had done or thought about other people. I always, and to the point of, I've been told growing up, you know, you put everyone and everything before yourself. And, and that's what could have contributed to my getting sick. And that's why I say, be kind to yourself first, because you do need to take care of your own health and, and not overstress yourself. Um, in or it's that whole, you know, being on the airplane and the oxygen mask dropping down, you need to put it on first. So if you're not taking care of your first yourself first, you're not going to be able to do anything for anyone else. Right. But um, definitely for me, I, I go through my day um, where I don't get out of the house often. 
But when I do, I make a point of, it's partly maybe selfish because I want to socialize. So I am talking to people in the grocery store or the drugstore or the aisle, wherever I can. You know, think about those people that are there for whatever, eight to 10 hour shift they're doing. And it's the same old mundane job. And you can, you can brighten their day. And you know what? It feels good. And that was, that was the whole thing too, is getting out of your own stopping and getting out of your own stress or your own depression or funk or whatever and helping somebody else for a minute makes you feel better. You walk away with an instant energy boost, um, improves your mood. You put a, it puts a smile on your face. So, right. I think in a way your illness, I mean, I can't speak to this, but it's, it's really informed so much of your mission. Yeah. It was a blessing in disguise, I call it, because I also was a type A, super stressed, super busy, go, go, go person, and it forced me to stop, and I mean, it made me bed bound and, and house bound and slowed me down, but it also made me realize that there was a lot of the world I was missing. It made me much more mindful and present in the moment instead of rushing to my car in the morning to get in, you know, into the car to drive to work. And, you know, I was never a road rage person. That's not my personality, but just being rush, 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 you know, then I could stop and actually take a minute to look at the roses that were blooming. <laughs> yeah. Real roses, you know, like, Hey, look, they're pretty vibrant and, and sit in traffic and look at the sky or, you know, whatever you're passing. So it was a blessing in disguise in a way. It made me, no, I'm no longer type A. And I used to always be on time or early. Now I'm always running a little late. Um, I was, I was OCD about the house being perfect and everything in order. And now it is opposite, completely opposite. But I realize what's important in life. That's what it sounds like. you your values got completely rearranged. I mean, not completely because you're always a very kind person, but maybe uh, like your values in terms of you know, sorting out that you needed to be kind to yourself first. I mean, it really was a tremendous thing, gift for you. So mm -hmm. do you, have you found that as you're doing more of your life mission, how is your illness? Is it getting better? Because I would imagine that as you're aligning more with your mission and aligning more with the, uh, the values that you're discovering, that that's going to also have an effect on your health. So I'm curious to ask about that. It definitely, um, it definitely provided me with feeling like I had purpose and value. My, my depression was severe and I had felt such low self-esteem. I mean, I had married, but I'd never had children. And at the time when I got sick, I was divorced and single. And so there, you know, it was work, work, work. And, um, so that's what I thought was my purpose. But now I'm, I'm realizing it's so much different. And so it, it boosted my mood, which always makes you feel better because, you know, you have more endorphins. It's giving you a little bit more energy. I feel now like more of a purpose of waking up in the morning instead of I'll just lay here in bed all day and why should I get out of bed? And, you know, I, I have a reason to get out of bed. And even if it's just... Um, looking, checking my messages on, on Facebook or social, other social media that um, I'm in network of folks like we met, but also in a network of kindness ambassadors that um, it's gives me, a, it, it's definitely a mood booster. Um, there's a lot of uh, symptoms that are not curable, that are manageable, but um, they have not gone away. But I think the pain which I suffers from severe fatigue and pain. Um, maybe it's just more, I can tolerate it more because I, I have, I feel good. I feel good by what I'm doing. Mm. You know, I live with that pain every day and, and my hours are reduced. It's not like I still can't work. I don't have, I, there's no way I could do a full-time job or even a part-time job because every day that I wake up, I have to see how I'm going to feel. But the value it's giving, giving me, um, and sense of purpose and meaning, and it, it's just helped confidence-wise. I think that's always something that we need. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I I truly love what you're doing. Um, 
can you I, can you share with me? I always ask my guests how how what did it take for you to free your voice? Because I know that this journey has been freeing, and you've shared a lot. But just like in a word, what what allowed you to say? Okay, uh, you know, my Facebook group is called Leaders in Self Love. What allowed you to step over, to step forward and say, I'm a kindness ambassador? You know, look to me. I'm going to share what I know. What did it take for you to do that? Actually, a lot of nudging by friends because I'm, I'm a very uh, private person and a modest person, not your typical Leo because I, I don't like the attention, but I realized that there was something in the message to help others. Um, not just chronically ill people, but they needed to hear it and they needed to feel a sense of purpose and that they could, they have value. And, um, you know, I had heard back from a lot of people who were severely depressed and, um, but also others who are just so the negative media today and just always just getting wallowing in that negativity, um, that people who are not sick. But so I just felt like, all right, I need to step out and, and try to do something. And right. so, and, and it's just my way of contributing. And then, you know, I'm sharing, I'm writing a book now that'll be out in, hopefully in a few months that I hope to continue to share. And it'll have, in addition to having acts of kindness and quotes on kindness, there'll be a little reflection question and journaling section um, so that they can make maybe a plan for how they're going to, not just read it and go, oh, that's nice, and turn the page, but how are you going to put this in action today? That sounds fantastic. Uh, what's the book called? It's called Color the World with Kindness, 50 Ways to Brighten Someone's Day. Do you want to see a sneak peek of the cover? I would love to. All right. And an artist friend drew this, mm. and it's kind of based on adult coloring books where the Bottom half is black and white, and then she's coloring her world with kindness, and it comes to full color. And here you are on the show, paint yourself into the picture. There's some kind of a connection here. Oh my gosh, you're right. <laughs> and she has, and she has a paintbrush in her hand. And the artist said that was me. So <laughs> there you go. How can people get in touch with you? I love that you you help people who are severely depressed, but I also love that you help the busy people or the people who the culture is saying you don't matter because you're not doing something big or glamorous or you know just like. Everybody can do this. Your message is so fabulous. How can people get in touch with you? They can find me. They can go to my website, um, www.60secondstokindness.com, and the 60 is the number. Um, or I'm on Facebook, the same, same 60 Seconds to Kindness, and then um, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest as kindness underscore junkie. So... Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Tay, so much for being here and best, best wishes and greatest success with what you're doing. Thank you so much for asking me. It was a pleasure to be here with you, Rita. Thank you. And thank you to our wonderful viewers for watching this episode of Paint Yourself into the Picture. If you like what you're seeing, stay in touch. My mission is to help women know that it's their time to shine. And if that resonates with you, then I show you how to make that happen in a sustainable and fulfilling way. My website is rebalinker.com. My Facebook group is Leaders in Self-Love. Please subscribe and like this video. I love to read your comments. Join us again next week for another healing conversation. Until then, remember that this is your turn to shine. Learn how to paint yourself into the picture, because this is how we heal. Seed is always to try just one more time. And that's from Thomas Edison, and he should know. All right, so let's go on. Our, let me introduce our guest, Tay Lynn. Her mission, her mission is to inspire others to live a more meaningful life by practicing kindness and acceptance to all. By sharing her own journey of loss, depression, and illness, she shows others how to make an impact and create a kinder world one minute at a time. She is the author of Green Smoothies to the Rescue, available on Amazon.
sharing how she dealt with a painful digestive disorder, Tay hopes to help others who may be going through similar issues. Tay, welcome to Paint Yourself Into the Picture. Thank you for having me, Reba. I'm thrilled to be here. It's so wonderful to have you here. I love what you do. And I'm just going to jump in and just say, Tay, what is your passion? My passion is kindness. <laughs> <laughs> kindness and compassion and acceptance and not judging others. Um, I really just found this um, passion as uh, when I when I became ill and found it as a means of making myself feel better. And so it's just taken off from there. It is, it's so beautiful. And what I'm hoping to accomplish in this, in this interview is to, to show the greatness of what you've discovered. Because what I find in this world is we all have such big eyes. I can't tell you as a coach. Hello, and welcome to Paint Yourself Into the Picture healing conversations to help us create the best and brightest picture of our lives. I'm Reba Linker, best-selling author, life coach, and manifesting guru, and I'm so glad you're here. We have the first guest on our new, on our new She Rose and Pathfinders series, and I'm so excited. But first, a two-minute teaching. When you learn something, it's important not just to learn the mechanics of the subject. It is also important to learn to adopt the mindset of the mechanic. So what I like to say in the beginning of my manifesting courses is that learning manifesting in this case is less like buying a lottery ticket and more like owning a Ferrari. If you buy a lottery ticket and it's not the winning ticket, you just throw out the stub and go on. It's over. It's done. If you own a Ferrari, needless to say, if something's wrong, you don't throw out the car. You take it to the mechanic and you find out what's wrong and you tinker till it's firing on all cylinders. So learning a new subject is very much like that. And it's so important. It's so self-loving to take on the mindset of the mechanic because the mechanic doesn't get discouraged when it doesn't go right the first time. There's a curiosity about figuring out the puzzle and making it work. So I'll just end this two-minute teaching with a quote from Thomas Edison. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed, and even in these interview series, how many people are approaching it like, I want to change the world. They have very, very big goals. And your goals, I know, are also big, but you're doing it 60 seconds at a time. Little. Little steps, baby steps. <laughs> yeah, so, so what was the journey like for you? I, were you one of those big-eyed people to start with? And, and how did you kind of come back to this? let's start small idea. Well, I think I've always volunteered um, as a kid uh, through adulthood in some fashion, um, particularly with the elderly in nursing homes um, and dogs and, and rescue um, shelters. Those always pulled at my heart as a child and, and through young adulthood. But um, after I became ill, I wallowed in a lot of self-pity for a while and and losing my job and not being able to work I felt like my purpose was gone because my job was my purpose or so I thought um, I never was able to have children uh, after being born with a kidney issue so I you know I was hit pretty hard with depression and thought you know that's it there's there's nothing left why even stick around here and so, seriously considered ending my life um, and it, there was like an epiphany one of the dark nights of the soul I guess they say where um, I heard a voice tell me that I was enough that I've always been kind and compassionate and to go out and spread that and that's my true purpose and you know I, I just thought well okay whatever <laughs> I heard it, but I, you know, again, I was, you, you kind of like, did I really hear that? Or, you know, but, um, you know, I have been going through so many doctors, uh, in the beginning being 
bed bound for eight months and getting trying to get a diagnosis that um, at some point on my journey, I was in a doctor's office and there was a uh, blind woman that walked in and um, couldn't tell if there were any empty chairs in the room. And so my simply helping her saying, oh, right over here, you can sit next to me, this chair's empty. And then continuing to help her as I'm filling out all my paperwork, no one else in the room, like 15 to 20 people would not assist this woman. She just would, you know, speak out loud, is my van here to pick me up? And everyone just sat there. So I got up and looked out the window and went in to see if her, her van was there and it wasn't. So she called the van service and then finally it came and there was a kid by the window, a young man, and he's mouthing over to me, it's here. I'm her now her guardian or go-to person so he wouldn't say it to her so I had to tell her went out and talked to the van driver made sure it was the right van for her and escorted her out and not thinking anything of it I'm just my, being myself I'm being kind and compassionate and then I sat back down and a young girl in the waiting room um I felt her looking at me. I looked up and she said you know that was really kind of you nobody was willing to help her and you stopped what you were doing to help her and it inspired me and I want to go out and help somebody or pay it forward today myself. So I thought, well, that was really actually very something simple to do. And yet it did make an impact not only on the blind woman herself, but on this other girl um, who witnessed it. Wow. And then I guess from there is where the idea began. And I just, on my own, started doing things whenever I got out of the house um, to go to a doctor's office or to the grocery store or the, the drug store, um, little by little. And then I was writing down little things that I had done. Journaling, because I would journal. You know, I just was journaling at the time. And um, I was speaking with somebody at one point that they said, this this is huge. You should, you should write a book. You should blog. You should. And I'm thinking, well, it's just little stuff I do. I mean, <laughs> and I didn't realize the power of it and how every little act adds up to a huge impact because every little thing you do along the way for multiple people, that's changing maybe three people's lives, five people's lives, however many people you touch that day. And it's going to create a huge impact in the world. And if we all did something together, what a he like a tsunami it would be. <laughs> yes, that's a, it's an, an incredible story. And one of the things that strikes me in the story is that it was something so simple and natural for you. Like sometimes people think it has to be hard. I have to do something really big. I have to do something really great. And I think our culture kind of promotes that. Right. And we all have these, like I said, these big eyes and these starry eyed dreams. And for you to realize it's, I, you know, you just had to be you. And that's amazing enough. Yeah. 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 And I, it led me to, um, first I started my Facebook page, um, 60 seconds to kindness on Facebook before 